Director of Connected Consumers. We are waiting for Mr. Brew McConan, Lead Developer at the International Trade Center. And we have with us our colleague, Mr. William Taborda, Information System Officer in ACTAD and the author of the publication we are launching today. The moderation will be in the hands of my other colleague, Ms. Valentina Rivas, Program Management Officer at ANCTAD. This session is organized by the ANCTAD Competition and Consumer Policies Branch, and it was possible thanks to the constant cooperation with the International Trade Center and Connected Consumers, which again, I thank and welcome to the, to the meeting. Let me just, before I hand over to Valentina, let me just mention a few uh, introductory um, words. First of all, just to remind all of us that ANCTAD is the focal point for consumer protection within the United Nations system, and it is the guardian of the revised United Nations guidelines for consumer protection since December 2015, when the United Nations General Assembly approved the the second revision of the guidelines and conferred this formal mandate to ANCTAD. For consumers, access to justice in broad terms is extremely important because it is the only way they can be um, sure that in case a replacement a reimbursement does not work, they can at least get some sort of redress and possible some compensation. So this is one of the issues also covered by the revised UN guidelines for consumer protection, which of course also introduced new guidelines on the protection of consumers in e-commerce. Online dispute resolutions, of course, are very much linked to e-commerce and um, ANCTAD, especially this branch, has been um, studying this issue, trying to see how to um, support further consumers uh, through mechanisms that allow them this access to justice in more immediate terms. And this is where technology plays a very important role. And on this note, I'm very happy to hand over to Valentina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Let me please describe or, um, what dispute resolution means. It's the use of mechanisms designed to provide consumers who have suffered economic harm resulting from transactions involving goods or services, including transactions across borders, the opportunity to resolve their complaints against businesses and to obtain redress. Online dispute resolution, and better known as ODR, you are going to hear us mentioning the term ODR a lot this session. These are mechanisms for resolving dispute facilitated by electronic communications and other information and communication technology that replaces in-person, face-to-face interactions. This can include online forms, telephone, or video conferencing that involve automated process through the use of software. Consumer care and complaints functions provided by a business can also be considered as part of the process. But if a dispute cannot be settled between the business and the consumers themselves, then an independent ODR provider can step in to help resolve the dispute. Examples of this include public ODR platforms on a national or regional level, private online dispute resolution system, and certain digital payment system, which are also mentioned in this publication. An ANCTAD research of 2021 concluded that in the digital age, online dispute resolution mechanisms can serve as a trusted intermediary between businesses and consumers. What is more, ODR system not only protect consumers, but are also good for businesses because this system boosts consumer confidence, which translates to consumers' loyalty to the businesses. These online mechanisms will also play to the benefit of small and medium enterprises to compete with larger platforms in the basis of trust. The same research highlights that consumer trust is essential for economies. For any healthy digital economy to grow sustainably, it is vital to protect consumers and to boost their confidence when e-commerce and cross-border are booming. So a useful tool for fostering consumer trust in the digital economy is effective online dispute resolution. 
The report we are launching today, and I invite you to download it from that QR code, is the fruit of uh, research carried out in the framework of a technical cooperation project that aimed to be the first step toward the implementation of consumer online dispute resolution systems in Indonesia and in Thailand. We can attest that the project was successful, and today both consumer protection agencies have workflows for handling complaints and resolving disputes that are adapted to their legislations and their, and their own know-how. Under the project, more than 100 uh, officers were trained in policy and technical tools needed for the implementation of such systems. Uh, so, but without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, William Taborda, who will present um, the project, and Will is the main author of this publication. William, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valentina. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today we present our paper titled, Technology and the Future of Online Dispute Resolution, or ODR. Although written some time ago, or Prepia laid a foundation which we aim to build upon today, particularly in light of recent developments in areas like large language models or LLMs. Our discussion will look into the potential impact and significance of these recent developments, especially in enhancing consumer online dispute resolution systems. Our session focuses on the impact of blockchain, AI, and chatbots in resolving consumer dispute online. These technologies have undergone impressively rapid changes in just the last few months, introducing both new solutions and challenges. As online transactions expand and technology progresses, consumers are encountering increasing vulnerabilities, including but not limited to the collection of private data, interaction with intentionally or unintentionally biased AI systems, the complexity of navigating new technologies, and growing disparity in access to advanced technology between consumers and businesses. Our goal is to effectively harness these technologies to provide efficient protection for consumers. Our discussion will be clear and direct, concentrating on the practical implications of these evolving technologies for consumer protection. Blockchain technology, often associated with digital currencies like Bitcoin, plays a crucial role in online dispute resolutions. Imagine blockchain as a digital ledger, not unlike a record keeping book, but spread across multiple computers worldwide. This makes it incredibly difficult for any single record to be altered without changing every copy of the ledger. In ODR, think of blockchain as a highly secure and transparent record keeping system. It's like having an unforgeable history of every transaction. This is particularly useful in online disputes or online purchase disputes. However, it's important to note that not all blockchains are created equal. Their effectiveness can vary based on how they are built and implemented. Very important to remember. Some blockchains like Ethereum, Cardano, and Solana are built for allowing the implementation of smart contracts. These are self-executing agreements where the terms are written into code. They can automatically handle tasks like verifying data and managing or executing transactions. This is huge for ODR. It means we can automate dispute resolutions, making things faster and more trustworthy. But it's not all smooth sailing, of course. We got to remember at least three, three key challenges regarding this technology. First is the re legal and regulatory hurdles. Blockchain is a new territory legally. It's using ODR my face regulatory questions, especially with smart contracts. We need to work closely with legal experts and regulators to navigate this new landscape. Technical expertise, blockchain, Integration in online dispute resolution expertise in, uh, requires expertise in cryptography and software development. Essential steps include training our teams and forming critical partnerships with sector-specific blockchain experts. Then we have security concerns. Although major blockchain implementations are secure, improper smart contract execution can lead to vulnerabilities. This is a very critical point. Let's think about these smart contracts as a real paper contracts that if uh, include loopholes can be exploited. Rigorous testings and auditing of our systems are crucial for ensuring safety. Let's now explore the case of Clarus. Clarus is a decentralized decision-making protocol 
designed as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. It introduces its own native token, Kinakion, or PNK token, to economically incentivize jurors to make fair and honest decisions. Jurors are typically selected through randomized process managed by the protocol itself. This process is often algorithm driven and designed to ensure impartiality and fairness. The mechanism usually involves jurors staking their native token to express their willingness to participate. Once they have staked their token, they become eligible for random selection. Jurors anonymously review cases and vote with the decision revealed only after all votes are in. The number of tokens they have staked affects their vote weight and potential token gains or losses during the redistribution. Basically, the jurors are uh, compensated if they vote according to the majority, without, of course, knowing the rest of the votes. Each three agreed. The Claros protocol enforces the smart contracts, executes the contract as it's in code, right? based on these decisions. Claros introduces a novel blockchain-based approach to online dispute resolution, emphasizing transparency and decentralization. While its economic incentive via the PNK token may not suit all case types, it represents a significant experiment in aligning juror behavior with fair outcome. Future systems can learn from Claros use of game theory to refine incentives, building upon its experience to Improve, uh, experience for improved implementations. Despite this innovative approach, Claros faces practical challenges. Using the, this token, the PNK token, isn't straightforward for everyone, especially those not familiar with cryptocurrencies. This complexity could discourage widespread adoption. Claros acknowledges these issues and it is currently focuses on re focusing on refining its platform for a broader user base. Claros has potential in business disputes, providing an alternative to typical internal decision-making processes within businesses. By delegating to the Claros network, businesses can demonstrate greater transparency and impartiality, enhancing fairness in customer or commercial disputes, with an emphasis on neutrality and cost efficiency. Now, I will discuss uh, uh, a case where uh, Claros was used in Mexico. And <laughs> So in 2020, uh, this legal case in Mexico introduced blockchain technology into a traditional arbitration. Two parties engaged in real estate leasing dispute agreed to include a unique clause in their contract, mandating, mandating the arbitrator to use the Claros protocol. So there is a formal arbitration uh, entity uh, sitting there with the mandate to use the protocol. When a dispute arose, the parties uh, initiated arbitration proceeding, proceedings, submitting claims and evidence. The arbitrator, in turn, integrated the Claros protocol into the process. Claros ran its algorithm and delivered a decision in favor of the landlord in this case. This decision was crucial in forming a basis of the arbitral award. Again, the arbitrator took this decision and, and let's say, uh, agreed with it, which was then rendered in, and signed by the arbitrator in a conventional manner. The real uh, test of this hybrid arbitration method came when the award needed to be uh, recognized by them uh, and enforced by a court. Despite no local precedent and limited usage of private arbitration in Mexican legal practice, the court conducted a thorough examination and it recognized the arbitral award as, a va as valid and ordered its informants, thereby acknowledging the Claros Protocol's uh, roles in the process. Claros stand out for its novel use of blockchain in dispute resolution. However, its broader capabilities, especially in consumer protection, is still a work in progress. The key is to make such advanced tech systems accessible and understandable to a wider audience, balancing innovation with user friendliness. Now, let's turn to another crucial technology in dispute resolution, artificial intelligence. AI plays a key role in enhancing online dispute resolution. Its ability to process vast amounts of data enables automation of tasks like sorting disputes and identifying relevant legal precedents. Precedence, speeding up resolution and allowing case handlers to focus on complex cases needing deeper insight. AI excels in analyzing dispute data, not just to settle individual cases, but to evolve the system as a whole, identifying and addressing recurrent issues preemptively. AI technologies like large language models can analyze dispute narratives, extract key details, and suggest resolutions 
based on historical data in conjunction with legal reasoning, AI legal reasoning. And this increase, of course, efficiency and consistency if well implemented. However, integrating AI into ODR demands <laughs> caution, particularly regarding privacy, data security, and avoiding biases in AI training. Ensuring AI decisions align with agency goals and values is crucial for their adoption in government work. That word is very important, align. Overall, AI's automation and analytical capabilities offer substantial improvement in ODR, but it's vital to address ethical and security issues responsibly. After discussing how AI enhances ODR through automation and data analysis, we now turn to specific AI application that directly interacts with users, chatbots. This transition from the general application of AI and data analysis, right? highlights the move from AI's broader capabilities in practical user-friendly applications in dispute resolution systems. Chatbots could serve as a conversational agent, simplifying the initial stages of a dispute resolution process. Their potential lies in assisting users with gathering information and categorizing disputes, thereby directing them towards the correct resolution pathway. The prospective role extends beyond being the first point of interaction. Chatbots could automate the initial steps of a dispute resolution, like basic assessment and data collection. Data collection can be from consumers directly, from internal data repositories, or for public data sources. Allowing human experts to concentrate on more intricate aspects of the dispute. Chatbot can automate early steps like assessment and data collection, being human expert for complex aspect of the dispute. Advanced models using technologies and large language models can, uh, can process natural language queries, offering clear guidance and helping users understand the rights and the process. Also, their ability to support multiple languages makes dispute resolution more accessible globally, helping users from various linguistic backgrounds. However, challenges like ensuring accuracy and secure handling of sensitive data must be addressed. While chatbots enhance efficiency, they don't replace the need of human empathy and judgment, at least for now. They should be used as supportive tools alongside human expertise, streamlining ODR and focusing on user. As we explore the integration of technologies like blockchain, AI and chatbots in online dispute resolution, it's important to consider their practical implementation implications in diverse legal systems worldwide. The adoption of these technologies goes beyond more technical implementation. It requires a nuanced understanding of different legal frameworks, cultural contexts, and policy environments, at least for its implementation in governmental services. For instance, implementing blockchain in ODR requires navigating various levels of regulatory acceptance and legal recognition of digital contracts and records. Countries like Estonia have led the way in digitalizing governmental services, including legal processes. Similarly, as previously discussed, Mexico has set a precedent for blockchain in arbitration. However, other regions might need significant legal reform to integrate such technologies. In regions with strict data privacy regulations like the European Union's GDPR, deploying AI to handle sensitive legal data involves regular, rigorous compliance. A practical method for integrating these technologies is a phased approach starting with pilot projects in selected jurisdictions, provide insights and help refine the technology in a manageable setting, collaborating closely with local legal experts and policymakers, ensure that technology aligns with legal and user needs. Additionally, continuous training for legal professionals will aid in its smooth adoption and effectiveness. Implementing these technologies also require addressing digital infrastructure limitations like hardware, software, skill, cybersecurity, and of course, the legal frameworks around. Especially in developing countries, collaborations among government, international bodies, and private technology firms are key to creating the, need, the needed digital infrastructure. International bodies can contribute expertise and resources to develop frameworks and standards aligned with global best practices. Technology firms bring innovation and the required hardware and software. This partnership should also emphasize training and capacity building to develop a local workforce skill in these technologies. Collaborations are vital for creating policies that promote technology 
adoption, technology adoption while ensuring data security and respecting cultural socioeconomic context. In summary, a collective effort, effort among governments, international organizations, and technology firms is key to building digital infrastructure and fostering an environment conductive to technological and legal innovation in developing countries. So, as we look ahead, the future of online dispute resolution is indeed promising, shaped by the integration of emerging technologies. These advancements are poised to make OTR systems more efficient and effective, especially for consumer protection. However, we must navigate challenges such as the one we mentioned, the need for technology expertise, adequate funding, particularly in areas with limited legal frameworks for those technologies. A collaborative approach involving United Nations member states and the private sector emerges as a practical solution. By working together to develop an open source ODR platform adaptable to different countries' needs, we can offer a cost-effective and versatile tool for consumer protection agencies. This cooperation could lead to better resource utilization, fostering innovation, and knowledge sharing. The Envision platform, designed to be modular for future enhancements, promises reduced cost and the benefit of open source development like transparency and community involvement. Establishing common standards is crucial for ensuring interoperability in cross-border cases, thereby enhancing global accessibility and effects. UNCTAD could play a crucial role in this endeavor, aligning with its mandate to support and guide member states through forums like the Intergovernmental Group of Experts on Consumer Protection, Law and Policy, member states have the opportunity to meaning to, for meaningful dialogue and cooperation. By working together, we can set shared objectives and develop a system that effectively caters to various countries. Aiming for a globally harmonized approach, UNCTAD is well positioned to assist in overcoming logistical and political challenges, offering technical support and potentially leading the coordination of software development and management. This involvement would be key in ensuring the platform's sustainable upkeep and evolution in time. In conclusion, advancing ODR isn't just about adopting new technologies, but also about global collaboration in a joint effort to create fair, transparent, and efficient system. This united approach is critical to address challenges and design ODRs with users' needs in mind. This way, consumers worldwide could enjoy quick and equitable dispute resolution, no matter where they are. Thank you. Thank you very much, William, for this clear and pragmatic presentation of the report. And well, mostly for the examples that you gave that help grounding the use of emerging technologies in, in ODR systems. I would like uh, now to invite our speakers to give us feedback on the report and to expand on the topics. I will start with Liz Cole from Connected Consumers. I don't know, Will, if you can change the, the image so we can see Liz. Uh, Liz uh, wants to see technology work uh, hard for consumers and put power, confidence, and choices back into their hands in the digital world. Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Valentina, and thank you for inviting me here today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to comment on this report, and congratulations to all the researchers and authors. Um, I think it pulls together not just what's happening now in ODR, but what technologies might contribute in the future. And of course, that final key point William made that this is actually a cooperation challenge as much as a technical challenge. Um, from the work that my colleague, Professor Christine Reefer and I have done into more generally the use of technology for the task of consumer law enforcement, which I'm going to speak about in a bit more detail later, I just wanted to pick up on some of the points in the ODR report, which resonated with me. And these are mostly with regard to data. So when we look at the bigger picture of how technological tools, including ODR, might be used to support consumer protection enforcement and ultimately better consumer outcomes, 
one of the first challenges we come up against is the lack of availability of structured data and of a consistent flow and consistent availability of that structured data. So let's think, for example, and contrast it with a sector like financial services, where here supervisory authorities have, have led the development of digital tools to support their tasks. But they have some advantage here in financial supervision, the availability of structured data is common. Of, of course, not every authority in every country will have the same quantity or quality of data or be able to import it into their systems in the same way. But because of the nature of financial markets being globally interconnected and carrying systemic risks, there is a much broader system, there's a cross-border system in place which imposes common reporting requirements on a huge range of transactions across the world every day. So for example, Basel III, which was developed after the um, great financial crash in 2008, and that includes uh, reporting obligations. So if these institutions are developing more sophisticated supervisory tech or subtech as it's called, or is looking to develop one's tools that work across borders or improve interoperability or start to push the limits of what subtech can do when it, by being powered by AI, their job is now to sort of focus on the best ways of capturing and analyzing this um, data and making more innovations or even looking more widely at unstructured data like voice complaints and, and seeing what they can do. So they're starting from quite a strong basis of data which allows them to innovate. But if we think about consumer protection authorities, wherever they are in the world, it's a much bigger challenge as they're at a very different starting point. So the availability of structured mandated data is relatively rare in non-regulated markets that a consumer law applies to. And of course there are exceptions um, in many countries for sectors like utilities who might be required to support to report on complaints or pricing or ac accessibility etc or of course for product safety which tends to have stricter registration and reporting requirements but generally there isn't a huge amount of of requirement for traders or companies to be reporting on practice so it's so simply put it's quite difficult to tell what's really going on at the consumer level so we find then that consumers are part of these huge online and offline markets, retail service markets, where there are very few requirements um, on companies to actually provide information about what's really happening and to know whether they're in compliance with the law. So we find consumer protection authorities have to then rely on alternative sources of data. So this might be unstructured data, for example, written complaints or court judgments, uh, voice recordings of marketing phone calls, um, even social media commentary on, on products and services and companies. So it's a quite different sort of data and it's not as consistent as the reporting that flows in, for example, in finance, but it is out there. And in the research we've done, we found more and more examples of how digital tools can innovate the collection and analysis of that data and therefore help to identify where there might be infringements of consumer law. So with that in mind, I think it's really interesting to consider the added value and the linkages that an ODR system can, can bring, not just in processing disputes, but in creating a longer term valuable data set for consumer protection authorities, companies and consumers. So for example, agencies could experiment with identifying data from social media commentary and complaints by social media audits. And the Bank of Ireland has done this um, since 2013, and it helps to gather real time insights about consumer experiences with the financial services provider and also spot where things are going wrong early. If people are commenting on what they're finding, that's going to be happening at a much earlier stage than when something's gone badly wrong and then at the stage of making a complaint. Um, another example, again, from finance is the Central Bank of the Philippines, which rolled out Bob and Bob is an online buddy chatbot, and that processes consumer complaints, so similar to what William was talking about earlier. So as well as providing a much easier interface for consumers, um, it, but the backend system is then classifying, storing, and analyzing the complaints. And in this way, consumers are themselves 
creating and generating a data set which the bank can interrogate to understand more about consumer experiences, to detect potential market misconduct, and not only to put things right, but then also to perhaps feed that into new rules and guidance if there are patterns and things that go wrong. We're staying in the Philippines for another example, but this time in a consumer agency where they have um, a complaints capture system that acts in conjunction with a dispute resolution system. The Philippines DTI Consumer Complaints Assistance and Resolution System, or DTI Care, is a web-based portal for consumer complaints and associated redress. So we can see how ODR can play a much bigger part in a range of other tools and engagement with consumers. Um, again, as just emphasizing what William said, success in this, of course, relies on a high level of usage by a broad spectrum of consumers. There's no point designing a fantastic resolution system if people don't come to it or know it's there. So that really relies on attractive, user-friendly design and functionality that works not just for the authority, but for the consumer. And then we're thinking about how teams in an authority would be working together. So the legal team with the digital team, with the data team, with the communications team. Um, and obviously for smaller organizations, that's going to be more challenging, but it's a, it, I think it's really important not to think of the tech people in one office, <laughs> uh, but to think of everybody as being part of an approach that uses technology. So if designed and communicated really well, ODR could almost become a consumer gateway to the authorities and, and therefore grow confidence in reporting problems and which would in turn further grow these valuable data sets. Um, so I think those three examples I gave are just a taste of what could be achieved with ODRs beyond their resolution function. Um, and my final message really would be it, it's, it's very important not only to think of technology in terms of one tool, but in terms of a whole approach for an organization. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to comment on such a fascinating report. Thank you very much, Liz. Oh, thank you. A round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Liz. Um, I took note of what you mentioned. Thank you mostly for bringing data in, into the table and by good quality data and the need for uh, consumer protection agencies to collect that data, we mean uh, well-structured, as you said, categorize, categorized and where subjects are uh, related. Um, so I will pass to our next commentator, uh, Bru Mekonen, IT developer at the International Trade Center. And Bru, as an AI and blockchain expert, uh, can you please help us understand the steps and the resources that are needed for integrating blockchain into existing ODR frameworks? And please, if you can also expand on the challenges and opportunities that AI can bring to consumer protection agencies. Some of them were already mentioned by William and by Liz, but if you have more. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. And uh, thank you for the great report, uh, William. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so blockchains or decentralized ledger, by its nature, uh, uh, necessitates for multiple parties to come together uh, and adhere to common protocols uh, and common system. So that, of course, therefore, the first step uh, is to, uh, to unite these parties under the same umbrella and make sure that they follow the same protocols. That would be the first step uh, to take. And uh, of course, applying blockchain technology to ODR means specifically designing um, uh, these systems so that uh, we adapt it to the realities of uh, distributed. Uh, William talked about smart contracts, and uh, smart contracts hold within them a great potential to make sure to automate some of the uh, uh, dispute uh, resolution processes or even avoid dispute to, to begin with uh, because of the contracts. And um, so, of course, designing blockchain systems means basically designing good incentive systems. They go hand in hand. So incentives, designing these incentives is very crucial. So when designing this incentive, it is, uh, Good to ask several questions. You know, what brings parties together to use this system? What brings merchants and what brings consumers to use this system? Uh, 
and what kind of um, incentives are necessary to make sure all stakeholders are agreed to the same protocols. And of course, every partner probably already has their own ODR systems in place, which varies in terms of maturity and is uh, uh, probably tailored to local uh, regulatory realities. So any blockchain based system that needs to be developed needs to be modular and phased. Modular in a sense that parties should be able to choose what features they want and to, to opt out and to opt in to certain features. And uh, phased in a sense that they do not have to implement it in one go. It has to be a gradual process. Uh, and so, and at the same, at the end, now, at the long term sustainability of this system, it's essential to establish a governance model. And this, you know, truly decentralized, purely decentralized systems may not be efficient or effective. So that's uh, talking about blockchains and designing or like making sure that uh, the steps that are necessary to adapt blockchains and ODR you know, systems. When it comes to AI, throughout the last year, we have seen a lot of progress, especially in large language models. We have seen a massive adoption to consumers. And now these things are not uh, only in academic discussions, but out there and everyday use and everyday things. So the, it is paramount to understand where this is going to, the challenges that we are facing, and how we will be able to adapt it to different use cases, for example, ODR. So there are considerations when we are, we have to consider when we are thinking of adapting these systems. There are challenges. Bias is one challenge that we have heard probably about this. Uh, there is transparency, how these models work internally, and there is uh, the issue of uh, alignment. As William said earlier, alignment is very important to align these things. So let's talk, uh, let's address these things one by one. One is bias. So the bias is a widespread issue in the whole of AI, and it's particularly problematic when applying AI to on a dispute resolution. To understand the origin of uh, bias, we have to examine the process of creating and training these models. So large language models are trained on vast amount of data, which is sourced from the public domain. Uh, on the internet. And this data contains various biases, such as those related to gender, ethnicity, geography, age, and political views. So when we examine the tra training process of autoregressive models, or in the other names, large language models, the core training process basically involves predicting the next word. What does it mean? When we think critically of this, for a model to predict the next word correctly, first it will need to know the patterns of language. Then it will start for it to become better at predicting the next word. It needs to understand the intention of the writer of this text. So as it becomes better, a model, as model becomes better at predicting the next word, it becomes better at predicting the intention of the original author of that text. So from the get-go, the model is biased towards the understanding of people who have had access and were able to author text on the internet. And it will it will be inclined, the model is inclined to reflect the perspective and understanding of these people. Then after the initial training, what we will have what is called foundation models. Foundation models are very good at predicting the next word, but they are not good at this. They lack something from what we want. We want chatbots, we would like uh, answer question uh, chatbots, not just simply something that predicts the next word. 
So to make them actually chatbots or agents or to actually fine tune them to our needs, we, f we do a process called, for example, one pro famous process is called uh, reinforcement learning through human feedback. This is a process in which uh, the model is further trained by a lot of people in guiding it towards outputting certain output instead of, for example, uh, 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 for example, uh, to, to make it do question and answer instead of just outputting um, I think, or in uh, online dispute resolution, for example, looking at certain specific outcomes and producing uh, suggestions. This involves large number of people and usually other bots, other AI agents, guiding it or biasing it towards a certain output. Actually, the technical term is called biasing a model. It's an essential part of it. So, uh, indeed, biasing the model is a crucial part, and this means setting ethical boundaries. This means uh, determining what's right or wrong in the context of models' responses. Uh, it's also additional set of regulatory boundaries. For example, they will train it, the AI model not to answer certain kind of questions. This is where certain <coughs> biases are introduced in the system. So, the issue of bias in AI model is complex because it's part of the training. It's part of the data that we have. The data that we have, historical that we have, data we have is already biased information. Uh, there are, it's not possible to eliminate bias or not even desirable to eliminate bias because it's part of the, de the design. But there are actions that we can take to minimize bias in uh, these lar large language models. One is to maybe, for example, entirely avoid public data to train on and use synthetic data to train these models. This is uh, uh, an active area of research that, holds prom that promises a future of AI. Another thing is to curate the data, which is an undertaking, because this data, what we are talking about massive amount of data. And uh, another way to uh, mitigate would be to ensure diversity and balance when we do the fine tuning when we choose the people who will be guiding this AI model to be an agent, we will need to maybe select a diverse set of people and uh, produce documentation and guidance to make sure there is a balanced uh, output. So moving to the next challenge, which is transparency. This is another challenge with AI where an output cannot be, we cannot determine why the model output certain output and not another one. This is very crucial, especially for on, online dispute resolution. You can imagine a future agent trying to arbitrate and coming up with a decision and someone challenging this decision. It would be very difficult to say why the model decides certain way and not certain other way. Unfortunately, there is no easy solution to this because the, the technology that underlines these AI systems, namely neural networks currently, is not uh, suitable for interpretability. It is very difficult to see what goes inside it, what goes inside these neural networks. Basically, they are, as someone puts it, inscrutable set of numbers, massive set of numbers. So to say what caused, what the model considered before coming to a decision might be impossible at curtain, at, at the, the technologies that we have right now. But there is a, an active research that is ongoing to make sure that these uh, uh, systems are basically based on um, uh, some kind of transparent decision models. This is also likely the future of AI. One more thing I would like to um, add about AI and the challenge that we are facing right now is hallucination. 
probably have experienced working, uh, like if you have experience uh, using these chatbots, large language models, they hallucinate. And why this hallucination happens, is very critical to understand why it happens, is that large language models or language models within themselves have knowledge model. As I said earlier, as they get trained, what they are doing is predict the next word. And to be better at this, not only they have to know language and know the intention of the writer behind what will come next to determine what comes next, but also they will create a model of the world. They will create a knowledge graph. They will try to understand the world. But it doesn't mean always they will understand every context. When there's a discrepancy between the language model's ability to generate text and its knowledge, this hallucination. This hallucination means basically in a, a true looking text will produce falsities. It will just produce a, a, a true looking false because it, it lacks it. But there is a good way to uh, fight this. There are two ways. One is to basically make sure the language models know their limitation and stop when this happens. This can be done by the fine tuning process itself. The, the next one and the more, uh, the more better approach is to, uh, of course, use a resource, okay, use your own data, your own knowledge model, and use the language models only for their language ability. Yeah, for language ability, but use uh, the own, uh, your own knowledge graph, basically. So this uh, takes us back to what William and uh, Liz said about how data is important going forward. Thank you. Thank you, bro, for your comments. And yes, <laughs> and, for, and for explaining the concept of uh, bias and challenges, well, transparency and hallucination. And of course, the tools to overcome those challenges. Um, so I'm now moving a little bit away from ODR, but uh, keeping the focus on consumer and the use of emerging technologies in consumer protection agencies. I would like to take the opportunity to ask Liz about the research she's conducting that she mentioned at the beginning on enforcement technology and how agencies can make more and better use of technology in the future. I hope Liz that you can um, give us this uh, explanation in seven minutes. Thank you. Can you see? I'm trying to. Yes. Okay. Oh. Oh yes. yes, I can see it on your screen there. Hold on a second. So you can see my presentation there, and that move. Yeah. Does that does that seem okay? Yes. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to talk um, about the transformative potential of enforcement technology, or as we call it, EMPTEC in consumer law. And this is a project in collaboration with Professor Christine Reefer um, um, Fund. Um, here is just about so basically EMPTEC stands for enforcement technology um, and the project grew out of a research project on cross-border enforcement of consumer protection which is based really on the fact that enforcement is not working optimally for consumers and meanwhile at the same time there's a rise in practices which affect consumers in digital markets which mean that um, lots of people are 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 facing problems um, getting redress and um, having their rights upheld in, in fast moving global digital markets. So we thought, what would it be like if there were interventions on behalf of the demand side, i.e. consumers, that, that actually matched the technological sophistication of the supply side, which basically means what would happen um, and what's going on in terms of consumer protection agencies <clears throat> making use of technological approaches to do the job of enforcement or to carry out some of those tasks of enforcement. 
So we called it Enf Tech because it accounts for the specific needs of enforcement agencies and tasks such as monitoring, detecting, analyzing, evidencing and executing sanctions. Um, and of course, enforcement can be done by other types of agencies, but with focus specifically on consumer protection. We found 18 examples of enforcement tech in use by consumer protection agencies. That's seven um, general consumer agencies and 14 authorities in total, which are a blend of competition and consumer protection agencies. And we also found 15 really interesting examples from non-consumer um, authorities and private sector organizations um, covering five continents and four generations of technology, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, the report is coming out soon and it's trying to, it's a collection of current activity uh, act as some support for agencies who are considering a tech strategy and a sanity check, if you like, for those people already using it to see where they are on the journey. Um, and I'll just quickly move on to why we the term EmpTech and where it fits with lots of other terms in this field. So you may have heard of legal tech, which is used by lawyers and law firms to enhance the analysis application of law. Reg tech or regulatory tech, which is used by companies to deliver on their legal requirements and compliance procedures. Subtech, which is the one I mentioned earlier, which is mostly used by supervisory authorities, um, almost always financial supervisory authorities, um, computational antitrust, which is used by competition authorities. And then we have EnfTech, which we are taking to be what, what is in use or which could be in use by enforcement agencies and consumer protection. So lots of different words there, but all essentially making use of technology to fulfill um, compliance and, and uphold against infringements. Um, I mentioned the generations of technology. We did this to really develop a framework to classify the range of technological tools which are out there. So this is based on some work done by DeCastri with regards to financial supervision and technology. But what we're looking at here and why this is really helpful is that it looks at the data sources which might be coming into authorities um, and what's possible, what analytics are possible on the basis of that data. Um, so in generation one, which is descriptive, we might have very limited manual entry with paper records, and that allows for a very basic analysis of what patterns and problems are occurring. So that might be like results of sweeps compiled by databases <clears throat> or complaints. And then the further you get along the scale, you have you move to diagnostic where you might be automating data entry, bringing it in through web portals, possibly by ODR, checking and validating that data. And that enables a much richer analysis of what patterns and problems are occurring and why. So that's why it's diagnostic. We then would move on to the third generation of predictive technology, which would bringing in much more of the big data that's out there, more frequent feeds, perhaps by API, automation and validation of that data. Um, and that enables you to, to do analysis, which is more predictive what and why problems occur in a lot more detail of what could happen next um fourth generation is prescriptive which is where it gets quite interesting again um more data coming in a more sophisticated ai enabled collection and monitoring of that data what's happening why what might happen next and what is a, a advised course of action so this is where the um using the intelligence or learning behind some of these machine learning tools could say actually if a company's doing this and it's done this for so long we think you should send a letter or we think you should um you know put a warning to consumers or something like that um so that's how we've arranged the examples we've found the final fifth generation we've developed through the project so this is an addition to the dicastry work we call this proactive this isn't happening yet in consumer protection and we're not predicting that it necessarily will but it's the key idea that if technology is used appropriately with the right guardrails then it could it could be possible to actually understand what's going on why what might happen next by identifying something to do and then one step further actually executing that action and we do see this kind of 
what's sometimes called algorithmic enforcement in things like IP protection on content platforms. So it's the actual execution of a remedy, a sanction or preventative measure. And that's where we think the use of technology in the future for consumer protection law enforcement could get really interesting um, and, may, and prevent or remedy problems at a much, much faster rate than we can do now. Um, I'm going to just leave you with these uh, these examples and just quickly move to these. So these, the report, ha as I say, has 18 examples of consumer protection technology tools in use. Um, here's five. You will notice that they are mostly from OECD countries, and that is where we found most of the um, examples. But I would say, if we think back to the table on generations, because something's at generation one or two does not mean it's it's lacking in any way or is not effective if you're thinking about taking a whole tech approach a technological approach across an agency you want to be using what's most appropriate and a really good example is here from colombia um, where there's a data analysis tool which calculates how you might apply it at, at what level you would apply a sanction a fine a fine to a company based on the severity of what they've done, the size of their revenue, their past um, past behavior, et cetera. And that's, that's done on the basis of an Excel spreadsheet. It's incredibly useful. It cuts out a lot of time um, for, for the officers um, so that they can focus on the more complex tasks. And immediately when that was presented, um, someone from another authority in another country said, can we, can we make use of, of the calculations behind that? Yes, of course. So you can see how something that simp doesn't necessarily need to be highly sophisticated to save time and resources and, 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 and also in this case, to start to build a data set of, of um, a, a record of sanctions. Um, the other examples here in Poland, a really interesting AI powered assistant, which detects abusive contract clauses um from the netherlands this is looks across websites to spot misleading pressure selling practices so the fake countdown timers that you might see telling you you have to buy something before the offer ends and often that offer doesn't end <laughs> um so they're looking at the code and where it's most likely that websites would be using that and checking whether they comply with unfair commercial practices and rules um the ACCC in Australia automatically detecting scams and malicious websites um, and flagging that they should be taken down. And the EU eLab um, shares lots of tools with different member states for remote mystery shopping. So screen recorders and private networks to capture the experiences a consumer might have. And um, I'm sorry, Liz, I have to interrupt you. We have outside the next session that is okay. starting soon. Well, I'll um, leave you with those yes, examples because I think they're the most, ex most interesting. And the um, report will be on www.emptech.org.uk. Sorry, .org. There. So you can look and find more. Thank you. We will share the presentation list in our webpage, so you can you can be contacted directly from there for questions. Okay. Unfortunately, we won't have time for questions, but William and Bru will be outside um, for questions over a coffee if someone wants to dip into these topics. Um, but I would like to close by saying that today's discussion highlights the need to work towards ensuring that consumer protection agencies have the necessary human and financial um, resources to promote, to promote effective compliance and to obtain or facilitate redress for consumers. Also, uh, consumer protection agencies need to improve their capacities in technology, which means recruiting specialists um, and training the existing staff. Third, uh, the exchange of experiences need to intensify between countries, and that can serve as a platform for this, although bilateral uh, cooperation needs to play a growing role in technology transfers. As we can see in the report, there are open source uh, platforms with excellent results from developing countries that can be used as models. And the action that we can take today is to be conscious of the importance of collecting data and ensure it is of the highest possible quality to train language large models and other future AR models, as was uh, mentioned by the three, the three of the panelists today. And of course, consumer protection should start collecting this data now. 
Um, with this message, I close the book lunch and I invite, I invite you all to join me in a round of applauses for the panelists. Thank you.